This is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. And our theme this morning is freedom from oppression. In the first lesson from the prophet Zechariah, it's freedom from political oppression. In the second lesson, it's freedom from our sinful human nature. And in the gospel, it's freedom from man-made oppression or religious regulations. All of this occurring on a weekend when we celebrate our freedom. Now that first passage from the prophet Zechariah is one that Christians will readily recognize as describing Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Matthew actually quoted part of this in his record of the event. Undoubtedly it originated as a hopeful, prophetic oracle with implications of the Messiah for Israel's covenant. The first part of the chapter from which the reading has been separated refers to many of Israel's neighboring clans and city-states and to being under the threat of an invasion. And then the subsequent verses defend Jerusalem as having Yahweh's protection. For the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, beginning at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And his battle bow shall be cut off. He shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Here ends the first lesson. We start to page 286 in the front of the hymnals. Psalm 145. We're going to read verses 8 through 14. And we'll do so responsively within the verses. Well, let's read it in unison. It'll be easy. Psalm 145, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone, and his compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They will make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his works and merciful in all his deeds. In our second lesson, I suspect I'm not the only one who can feel the conflict in St. Paul. He knows what he should be doing. He can't bring himself to do it consistently. He knows what he should not do, yet he can't avoid doing it. And that same struggle exists within all of us. We find ourselves slaves to our behavior or slaves to our emotions. From Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, Verses 15 through 25. St. Paul writes, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it's no longer I that does it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. 
I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I that do it, it's sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my innermost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here ends the second lesson. In our gospel, Jesus invites people who are burdened to come and come to him. Now Jesus was reacting to the religious leaders of his day when he said that. For many of them were very quick to impose laws, and regulations upon the people, but did nothing to help them. In much the same way, you have heard me lament how churches in our time will tell people it's not morally right to do this or to be that, but will do nothing to help those people cope with their circumstances. It's like telling somebody you're bad for doing what you're doing, but I'm not going to help you deal with it. It's wrong to be who you are, but I'm not going to provide any resources for you whatsoever. Jesus instead says, come to me, and I will give you rest. We rise to the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel according to Matthew, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 16. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. 